understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? It is time for the podcast. We're going to be all America today. And of course, the reason is this election, a most consequential election, could turn the United States from a country we know into a country that looks, feels, smells, and acts very, very differently, not least because Donald Trump is and apparently pulling away in the states that matter. And we're going to go and talk to Tom Frank, who I'd say, John, it's fair to say is our resident American pundit for the <laughs> yes, podcast. He is. Yes. Overexcited <laughs> resident. Yes, he is. Overexcited <laughs> resident. So let's just go straight to Washington and talk to Tom Frank. We are now going to the United States to talk to the wonderful Tom Frank to give us an update as we close in on about 15, 20 days to the election. The United States, Tom has just announced off air that uh, John was saying to Tom, you know, Tom, would you get rid of the chewing gum because it kind of sounds bad and the podcast for chewing away? And Tom says, no, it's not chewing gum, it's nicotine tablets. And then John says to Tom, oh, you're a smoker. When did you give up? And Tom says, I've never smoked in my life. It just gives me a buzz. This is the sort of guy he is. Tom, how are you? Buzzed up and ready to rock and roll. Mr. McWilliams, I'm ready to talk some, I'm ready to talk some economics. Well, actually, let's talk about the United States. Yes. I'm looking at the polls. I'm seeing Mr. Trump moving ahead in the places he should be moving ahead, i.e. the places he can win the election in what the hell has happened in the last two or three weeks to the Democratic campaign so that on a number of swing states, Harris is now trailing yeah. Trump? What well, it's, it's just there's this sort of there's a natural process of the sort of the shininess coming off the new product. Look, compared to Biden, she she's a very attractive candidate. She's smart. Uh, she can speak on her feet. She seems at first like a very good candidate. And as you mentioned, her performance in the debate with Trump was, well, it was excellent, but in debate terms. So there's two really excellent debaters out there. Now, Harris is very good. J.D. Vance is also very good. And they both used all the sort of tricks. Give me an example. Give me an example. So one of the things that you do in high school debate is you you lead the other team astray. You make them waste their time. It's It's a timed event, a lot like chess, right? You trick the other team into wasting their time on things that don't matter. And she did this repeatedly with Trump. Like she made fun of his personal fortune. She said it was much exaggerated. He inherited it all from his dad. She made fun of his rallies. She said people find him boring and he wasted his time defending his, you know, his business over the decades, talking about how his rallies are so, what great fun. They, all that stuff. That was a total winner for her. That was very good. But now this is what I cannot understand. Okay, this is we're trying to get our heads around the psyche of the average American who, as you said, has seen both the products. They've seen yeah. Trump a long time. There's nothing that Trump is going to reveal today that you don't know about him. Yeah, if anything, he has, I mean, a polite way to put it is that he has slowed down since 2016. I thought he was uh, genuinely interesting in 2016. He was saying things that were off the wall that nobody had said before. He was saying a lot of really vile things, but he was also saying a lot of things that resonated with audiences. And he's not doing any of that now. You know, if you watch his speeches now, he's all over the map. So the Republican convention, by the way, also very well managed. Their their convention in 2016 was a the last time they had one was a disaster. Well, that's completely reversed this time around. So for four days, they do nothing but build him up. Every speech is about him and how wonderful he is. And there's nobody sounding a discordant note, you know, like Ted Cruz did in 2016. There's nobody going out there and saying, you know, where are we going, Republicans? What the hell has happened? Everybody's on board with this. This guy's wonderful. They're all thanking God for preserving his life after the assassination. Of course they are. Of course they are. <laughs> you know, the, the final day was incredible. You have, uh, I, I should give you a detail. This will This will set the stage for you. This is so the political conventions in America, the presidential candidate generally does not appear until the final day. Okay, they come out at the end to accept the nomination and they give their speech and it's and it, it ends on this moment of triumph. Trump was there every single day. 
And when he would, he would come into the auditorium about halfway through the proceedings, everything would stop. And the announcer would say, ladies and gentlemen, Donald J. Trump. And he would come out like a, like he's a one man sports team, you know, coming out through the tunnel into the arena. And he would walk up to the great thunderous applause and take his very special seat. So everybody else is sitting on folding chairs or auditorium chairs, and he's sitting in this big uh, kind of a throne, right? A white armchair. And then he has his, his entourage sitting around him. And from that point on, every speech is addressed to him personally. Every speaker is speaking to him. It's this audience wow. of one, yeah, this audience of one thing. This is like the, this is like the emperor has arrived into the auditorium. Bingo. It's exactly like cults, that. And, and uh, but it, wait, it gets it gets worse. So every speaker makes, you know, strenuous efforts to flatter him and to talk about how wonderful he is and to thank God that he's still alive. And as they do this, the camera will sw- you couldn't see this at home, but the camera would switch to Trump. So we'd be in the in the auditorium watching a speaker praise Trump to his face. And then the on the jumbotron the camera would be on Trump as he accepts the praise and he would, he's not mic'd up. So he would mouth the words, thank you. And, uh, and, and we would all, we would all watch this and cheer. It was, it was freaky. And yeah, this incredible buildup for four days, this goes on, including things like high points, like the, the president of the Teamsters union, which is not something gave a rip roaring left wing speech at the Republican convention. I don't know if you saw this, it was extraordinary. And and then Trump comes up, right? So you have, uh, like I mentioned, Hulk Hogan tearing his shirt in homage to Trump. You have Kid Rock comes out and sings this song called American Badass. And we're <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump as as the American badass, right? And all of this is incredible buildup. Like, and, and I, I, by this time, I'm down on the floor. I was, uh, at, you know, I was less than 20 yards from Donald Trump himself, and he proceeds to give the most boring speech of all time. It goes for an hour and a half. Yeah, no, it's almost as bad as a Bruce Springsteen concert. <laughs> you know, the, the first 10 minutes or so, he recounts uh, the assassination attempt, and that's kind of interesting. But after that, he's just all over the map he's just wandering did he have notes tom yeah he had a text so uh and the text is on so i could see the text because it's on a big uh screen at the back of the hall and because i'm on the floor i can turn around and see what the prepared remarks are and so i could tell you when he's ad-libbing and he ad-libs all the time you know he always does this he tells all these stories about people who have been the victims of immigrants so illegal immigrants who come to america and commit you know, vicious crimes, but it's like that the whole speech just on and on and on. And I didn't have a seat, right? The floor is very crowded. It's like one of those, like when I would go to a punk rock show back in the old days, yeah, the mosh pit. It's ex- yes. It's extremely crowded. And uh, you know, <laughs> you can't sit down. You can barely move. You're like, what the hell? When is he going to stop? When is he going to release us? You know, it, it was that bad. But, Tom, I want to take this picture that you've painted of the emperor. <laughs> Uh, taking homage yeah. from the underlings, right? Yes. And while yes. you're talking about this, I was reading about the end of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and the old emperor Franz Josef used to do exactly the same thing, would take homage, and he'd have his own certain place in operas all around Austria-Hungary that they had the actual royal box. Yes. And, of course, the royal box was supposed to unite everybody around. Yeah, no, that was an presence. emperor. That was an yeah. emperor. I- <laughs> right, right. But at the end, at the end, the way in which the emperor behaves gives you an insight into the way in which the place may well be governed in six yes, weeks' time. you so are exactly right. this is what right. I want to come to. So yeah. if Donald Trump wins, right, what does that... As seems quite likely right now, as by seems the way. Quite, yeah. What does that al fresco obsequiousness mean for the way in which America will be run? So it's, I'm trying not to be an alarmist these days. I'm like you, I'm a, I read the newspapers. I think about the world. I think about history. I think critically, and I'm trying not to be alarmed by what's going on, but, but I I do find him alarming. You know, he was, he was flatly incompetent in his first time around. 
and his presidency ended on a very, very bad note. The uh, the the sort of this riot on January sixth, where they broke the into the Capitol of building. Understatement on a very <laughs> yeah, bad uh, note. Very bad note. <laughs> and and what you typically find with, especially with Republican presidencies, is that they pick up where they left off. And I would hope that he had learned the lesson of that. Like, don't do that again, Donald. <laughs> but I'm willing to bet you money right now that he did not learn that lesson. And that he will pick up where he left off. And he does have a very authoritarian sort of tendency to him. Now, in his first administration, that was sort of muted by his incompetence, if you will. So, for example, uh, when the COVID pandemic hit, this country, I don't know about Ireland, but um, America was screaming out for strong leadership. I mean, this country really wanted strong leadership. We we could use a Franz Josef right then, and we didn't get one. He was like, I'm going to delegate this to the states. You know, I'm going to get the private sector. Do you remember this? Yeah. It was, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. awful. It was like the one moment where we were, you know, we really wanted strong leadership, and he didn't, he didn't furnish it. But on things that are important to him, that, that are that are the political equivalent of looking in that gold-plated mirror. Yes. You know, I do fear. And look, we've in America, we've spent, you know, it's a very powerful country, America is, and we've spent the last 50 years heaping up more power in the office of the presidency. Now, we've done this because we have become convinced over the years that Congress can't do anything because they're always squabbling and they never pass anything and blah, 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 blah. And so we've given the president a lot of power. And let's say Trump gets good advice this time. By good, I mean competent advice. Mm -hmm. So last time around, he was very poorly advised. You look at the people he appointed to his cabinet, and it was all his like cronies from big business, you know, his fellow yeah. billionaires, and they didn't know what they were doing. And this time around, there's the concern is that he will bring in intelligent people. And, the, you know, the Heritage Foundation has written a blueprint for him. He said, I'm not going to follow that. But, uh, you know, he probably will. He, you know, it, it, they probably got some ideas in there that appeal to him and his friends. And so that's the concern is that he will be advised by people who do understand the power of the presidency and are willing to use that power and, are, and dare to use that power. I do think that is frightening. And we, I mean, to, to putting all that aside, look what he wants to do. There's two big things. One is tariffs across the board, you know, which is I'm sorry, that's really stupid. And the other yeah. is 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 mass deportation. This is a recipe for a recession. Absolutely. Almost instantly. Can I come back, Tom, to, to one thing, right? Last week, we were looking at, it's a bit of a leap, the Nobel Prize winners for economics. Yes. And we were look, talking about the, the, the three guys who'd won it. Their basic idea was that poor countries get rich because they've got very good institutions. And the institutions bolster economic growth, blah, 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 blah. Yep. But the corollary is also the case, Tom, that rich countries get poor also because their institutions become degraded. Yes. What are the chances that Trump so degrades the institutions, like the Federal Reserve, like the Supreme Court, like, as you say, the, the immigration service, like, for example, the notion that America is the upholder of the multilateral trade around the world? Yeah. They degrade that. And gradually, but clearly explicitly, this has a massive impact on the economy. Yeah. I like to think that what Trump will do, it, unless this has all gone to his head, and it probably has, is that, is that Trump takes things like that seriously because he, you know, he's got his business advisors. He does listen to them, right? He does listen to his, his fellow billionaires. He takes them very seriously. So one assumes that he wouldn't, the, the real danger lies elsewhere. But um, so look, America's already messed up the economy in in a sort of fantastic way, Mr. McWilliams. And you, you've heard my spiel many times. So I go to this every year. I go to this conference in Ireland. I don't know if you know about it. And <laughs> <laughs> I like to regale the people of your country with tales of what of what it looks like in the sort of deindustrialized hell zones of of middle America, you know. Like the places that J.D. Vance talks about. And these places really have been, they do have a legitimate grievance. And they really have been left behind. And a lot of this was done deliberately by um, administrations, I'd say, beginning with Reagan, but continuing through Bill Clinton and George Bush and Barack Obama, those four guys, that where they, there was an absolute consensus about what economic policy looked like. And it was basically... 
you know, deindustrialization was fine, nothing to worry about. You know, we can export our manufacturing and just, you know, buy. And, and this was this was disastrous in all sorts of ways. But and then also at the same time, cut taxes for people at the top. And, you know, I'm now 59 years old and I know a whole lot about <laughs> about this stuff. What you're describing is basically for a lot of Americans that has happened already. I mean, it has already taken place. The America that they grew up in, this sort of middle class country in the, you know, that I grew up in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s, that's gone, you know, and their their anger about this is volcanic and it never stops erupting. And that's what makes Trumpism possible. Uh, now, whether Trump is going to fix that, of course he's not. <laughs> you know, absolutely not. The only, and the, by the way, this is the, the really sad thing in all of this discussion is is uh, that we now overlook Joe Biden, and Biden is Biden actually had the right idea in a lot of ways. You know, the country is really turned against him. You know, he's he's very unpopular right now, but uh, Biden was trying to do the right thing in all sorts of ways, uh, encourage manufacturing in America. He was the, been the most pro-union president we've seen since Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he tried to uh, uh, break up a lot of uh, you know monopolies, which again, nobody has tried since the days, you know, since the 70s. He was doing all sorts of things that are really good ideas that really need to happen. And frankly, it, he was taking a lot of cues from Trump. So Trump encouraged a lot of these things when he was president, but he didn't do them. He didn't do them. He yeah. talked but the same with Afghanistan. So Trump would always talk about we got to get out of F. We got to end these endless wars. Well, Biden actually went and did it. And now Trump is you know, constantly, constantly criticizing him for how he did it. But it was Trump's idea. You know, in, in a lot of ways, Biden was trying to do these things, but in a responsible way. And I and I feel like this is the road that we should have been going down. And now it looks like we're it, do, it doesn't matter who wins. We're, we're abandoning that course. Uh, because I think Harris is, you know, her advisors are largely these Silicon Valley types. By the way, so are Trump's. This is just in the last few years. Remember when it was uh, it was Wall Street was calling the shots in both parties. You remember? And yeah, now no, it's absolutely. now it's now it's Silicon Valley. You, look, you know, Elon Musk out there. And America always goes to where the money goes and the money's in Silicon Valley. Tom, what what effect do you think that Elon Musk's input now, both financially and being on the campaign trail with Trump, what impact is that having on Americans and their and these swing states in particular? Well, it's, uh, you know, in America, there's a cult of the entrepreneur, you know this. Mm. Uh, and it has existed like this since forever, as far as I can tell. And for a lot of that, the, the people who, who sort of subscribe to that cult, yes, he is, he's a hero. And I, and I think that's a small percentage of Americans. But he does control Twitter, which, you know, Twitter was such a huge part of the election in 16 and again in 2020, both in what they permitted and also in what they cracked down on. And, uh, uh, he, you know, you shouldn't underestimate that, that it's now in basically his personal control. Yeah. yeah. Can, can I just go into why why people are so uh, think this now? There's there's two Shit. there's there's two important news stories. You remember what I wrote about in What's the Matter with Kansas, where the, uh, white working class people at the time were abandoning the Democrats for the Republicans. Now it's across the board. It's working class people of all races. And this is shocking. OK, this is shocking. If you go on Kamala Harris's website and you go to what her economic plan, the first thing that comes up is this, uh, you know, very uh, uh, detailed pitch to black men specifically. And you look at that and you're like, oh, my God, if the Democrats have to work this hard, black voters are one of the most loyal Democratic constituent groups. I mean, absolutely rock solid. Right. If she really has to nail that down, that's a bad sign. That's a bad sign. Now, on the other hand, it's it's shameful that the Democrats have been taking those voters for granted for 50 years, which they have. You know, and they don't give them anything. And it's about time that they you know, that they that they got something right. It's about time. But at the same time, it is for, for people like you and me who you know, worry about elections, that's shocking. Uh, the other side of that is um, unions, the Democratic Convention. I've never seen such a union presence at their convention. That's helpful and good. On the one hand, they should be paying attention to unions. On the other hand, if they're losing union voters, 
again, one of the most loyal Democratic groups over the last 50 years. If they're losing these guys, they're in deep trouble. Wow. So you think that two most significant constituencies that they can always depend on yeah. are migrating, are not voting, or are going directly to Trump? Well, a lot of the union members are voting for Trump. This is why you've seen that there's this terrible, you know, these fights inside the unions about who they're going to endorse. And so you see the yeah, Teamsters. Can, can I just get something straight here? How could a trade union man steeped in the notion of protection for workers' rights, for increased pay for workers, vote for a guy who has in his actions, not in his rhetoric, <laughs> I know. in his <laughs> actions done everything? Yep to diminish the role of the working people in the United States? Hey, that's the question of my life, buddy. And uh, the, the, uh, the, I would say at this point, the answer is, so the culture wars, that's a big one. Tariffs, that's huge. So Trump also, he talks, as you point out, He's been kind of a monster on this issue. At the same time, he also talks really big about punishing companies that try to move factories overseas. So the unions for ever since NAFTA was passed, the unions were, you know, NAFTA is the big trade agreement back in the 90s. And uh, the unions were strongly opposed to it. I mean, it was for them, it was a life and death issue. They pleaded with Bill Clinton not to sign it. Clinton did it anyways on the theory, we talked about this last time, on yeah. the theory that yeah, yeah, they yeah. have nowhere else to go. Ever since then, they have, you know, every union member in America knows that these trade agreements were designed to screw them over. Everybody knows this, both because their union tells them this and because management tells them this all the time. Management is forever in any kind of negotiation. Management is always saying, you know, you have to give us this, you have to give us that, you have to give us the other, or we're moving the plant to Mexico. They always do this. There's, I mean, there's studies of it. They do it all the time. Everybody knows this. And the Democrats, like, you know, the Obama Clinton faction are like, well, you know, that's, that's, that's globalization. Nothing you can do. Sorry, guys. And here comes Donald Trump. And he actually threatens to do something about it. Now, he didn't actually do anything, but he talks about it, right? And he, so talks, he's talking he talks very tough about it. And so people like that. Okay. But, but is, is, uh, is J.D. Vance more of a doer, do you think? Well, he's new to politics, right? He's only been yeah. a senator for two years. Uh, but uh, in his speech at the convention, by the way, so his speech at the Republican convention, the first thing he talks about was uh, Joe Biden voting for NAFTA back in 1993, uh, I think it was, or 94. It's the first mm. thing he talked about. The second thing was that Biden voted for uh, another one of the big trade agreements, the, the, the one with China which was devastating for American manufacturing. And then the third thing was that Joe Biden was in favor of the Iraq war. The Republicans were, this was a Republican war, but, but he, he, he dinged Biden for it at the Republican convention. It was, it was unbelievable. This is, so Vance is, Vance is fascinating because he's, he's turning the tables in all sorts of ways. And also this is because this is new for Vance himself. If you go back and look at his book, Hillbilly Elegy, or the movie, they made a movie of it. He's not a friend of the of, of working people. He comes from them. This is his family. This is his community. But he basically blames them for their own mm. situation in the in the book. You know, these people are are living like this because they don't have what it takes, basically. And in both book and movie, the Deus Ex Machina that rescues J.D. Vance personally from this terrible fate is Yale Law School. <laughs> <laughs> that home of the Which working is, man. Yeah, yeah. No, this is Obama. This is Obamaism. You know, where where that's the only possible way to rescue America's you know ruined you know blue collar population is is get it get is learn to code, get an education, go to go to Yale Law School, and if you don't, you got nobody to blame but yourself. And I, I it's like we as a country, we have totally now rejected that ideology. But that was that was Vance. You know, <laughs> ten years ago. Now he's changed. He's completely changed sides now. But but, but what about the theory, Tom? Of and it's a bit of a conspiracy theory. But J D. Vance and the rest of the MAGA guys in the background getting Trump in as president and then sidelining him. Yeah. And what what do you think about that? Is there any kind of truth in well, that? Well, I used to say I used to say that when Biden was 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 still the 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 candidate, I I would say you know we talk about politics a lot in my house. I live. <laughs> <laughs> right outside Washington, D.C., it's all we talk about, that the, the two VP candidates 
at the time Harris and, and Vance, that one of them is going to be the next president after you know whoever wins this election for sure. Yeah, uh, these two guys are are, are elderly. Uh, they are you know the, they're visibly failing. Trump. I mean, look, I'm not a doctor. I haven't examined him. I don't know, but he he wanders all over the place. You know, Vance is is young. He's got his wits about him. He's very intelligent guy to all appearances. Same with Harris. Yeah. So I I think it is very possible that, yeah, uh, Vance will. Well, who knows? Trump will be a lame duck from day one. But Vance and company, Vance is, is, is young. Vance is ambitious. Vance comes with this uh, Silicon Valley entourage who are extremely ambitious and very, very wealthy. And yes, I, I, I think we're going to be in a new in a new world. I also think, look, there's something very transactional about Musk supporting Trump. Trump has promised to crack down on imported electric cars. What does Musk manufacture? It's electric cars. There, he's going to do all of these favors, you know, for Elon Musk. Elon Musk is a huge federal contractor also. You know, NASA, we have the space agency. They hire out to Musk. That's how they get their satellites up there. That's how they launch their their rockets. It's with Elon Musk. He's a huge federal contractor. It's funny, this kind of thing. You'd think it would be illegal. <laughs> Yeah, only in America. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I we didn't even to... talk about Kamala on Fox News. Did you see this interview she did? Yeah, that was News? a bit of a disaster, wasn't it? Yeah, well, except for one part of it, I thought she was excellent. She's very good at two things. One is talking about uh, abortion rights. She's very good on this. It, she feels it intuitively. She talks about it uh, naturally and, and with passion. And the other is the menace of Trump. She's excellent at talking about that. Uh, and she really I thought she broke through on that. But but otherwise, yeah, it was it was it was rugged. <laughs> but but should she not? Because the, the way I saw that is should she stop talking about Trump as the person and focus more on policy and she would get more. But, traction but this there. is look, the Democrats, uh, the, the, the problem is that the public is um, is very unhappy with Biden uh, and very unhappy with the state of things. So the two biggest issues, according to the polls, are immigration and inflation. And they, they, they blame both of them on the Democrats. And Trump is way ahead on both of those. But inflation is down to 2%. It, right. But they, they, they look at the price of gasoline and they say, well, it was lower when Trump was president. You, you yeah. know how this works. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people are bitter. People are angry about it, even though it has stopped. They're still angry about it. We saw this in the 70s, too. Jimmy Carter got punished for it so badly in 19. Well, he lost for a lot of reasons in 1980, but that was one of them, mm. even though yeah, it was over was by then. It was definitely worth the We're actually going to we're going to we're going to end this podcast talking about the vibe session. This is the idea in the United States that you have all the economic indicators in the United States for the last two years have been very very positive. Yeah, Large have you checked two, out the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lately? I mean, it's insane. Yeah, and yet there's the vibe is not working. So. Americans are calling this, well, actually, in fact, not Americans, it's Kyla Scanlon, this wonderful, very young female economist. She came up with this term called vibe session. And yeah. what she's basically saying is it doesn't seem to matter. The vibes are bad. I have, I have, I have problems with that. I think it's more like a delayed reaction. You know, but we we we've both seen times where the economy was. I'm thinking of the '90s here, where the economy was good and people just couldn't stop loving Bill Clinton for it. Do you remember that? And the yeah. uh, and and they thought he was the greatest guy in the world. And but there it was a delayed reaction too, because you could see that it was hollow. You know, it was built on this dot com bubble. It was not good, and yet he was extremely popular towards the end of his administration. And it didn't, but it didn't help out Al Gore, did it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to go. Tommy Boy, we will talk to you again. That was wonderful stuff, as always. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm excited to do it again before the shit comes down. Okay. Tom, brilliant as always. And do you know what's interesting when he was talking about Elon Musk there? I saw something there recently about this guy, Mark Cuban. Have you ever heard of Mark Cuban? Well, I've uh, heard of him, but I don't really know who he is, but I've heard yeah, of him. Yeah, yeah. He's he's just another billionaire. And he's okay. having another... So they're two a penny at this stage, Joe. Yeah, he's having a, a billionaire spat with uh, Elon Musk at the moment. But the interesting thing about Mark Cuban is he is kind of bright and he's kind of he knows what he's doing. But first time round, he was very much a Trump supporter. And he helped Trump out during the COVID pandemic, et cetera. 
But the reason why he voted for Trump first time round was because Trump wasn't a politician. And it was kind of very much anti-establishment, you know, yeah. vote for anybody but a drain politician. Drain the swamp sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah drain exactly. the swamp. And that's kind of a theme that's going on here. People don't want to vote for politicians anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting that this time around, he is voting for Kamala Harris. Anybody but Trump, he's kind of calling for, which is really interesting. And most going the other way. I mean, the, one of the problems with Americans is we, and America in general, is we genuflect to billionaires as if they know a little bit more about the world than everybody else. Now, one of the greatest expressions I've ever heard, I think, when it comes to billionaires is that every billionaire is a policy failure. It's a wonderful expression, right? Yeah. Because a society that encourages and then, as Tom was saying, lionizes the entrepreneur billionaire sort of character as, you know, the greatest form of humanity that has ever been delivered on God's earth will tend, therefore, to overlook the issue of inequality. Yeah. And in the United States, one of the promises of the United States is that we're not so worried about billionaires as long as you too can be a billionaire and as long as the billionaire can become poor, right? So you yeah. can go up, you can go down, but as long as you can go up and you can go down, the society then generates its own dynamic. But the problem with billionaires is if you look at the amount of very rich people now, the majority are from inherited wealth. And that's yeah. the problem, is that yeah. the billionaire enmeshes inequality into the system. And as you say, Trump surrounds himself with other billionaires. And they see the world differently. Of course they do, because they don't have any sense of what actually people's daily lives are like. Yeah. But be that as, as it may, and I think we we'll leave it here, the genius of Trump is that he's able to do the following. That was a wonderful expression. Trump is what poor people think rich people look like. Mm -hmm. And he's managed to say to the poor, I'm on your side. Remember he said, I like the uneducated. Yeah. Because he realized yeah. that what people who are actually falling through the cracks is they don't hate rich people in America. They hate academics. They hate intellectuals. They hate the thinking class, the podcasting class, actually, it must be said, right? Yeah, well, that's exactly what J.D. Vance is talking about. He, he has yeah. called out university academics and professors as the enemy. He actually said that. That's a quote, which is In which case, scary. we should be very, very, very nervous. It's, Says the adjunct professor of economics at Trinity College Dublin. Listen, we'll talk to you Thursday.